I know uh, Dr. Brownie uh, for quite a, a few years, and uh, actually we shared a lot of ideas together. And we worked uh, and are uh, working on several research uh, projects. It was a wonderful experience for me to learn from him and his team. So uh, I would take advantage of this opportunity to say thank you uh, for Dr. Browning's uh, guidance and support in the long time. Um, may I introduce uh, Dr. Browning's background? Okay. Uh, Dr. Browning's uh, 14 years research career encompasses three domains, including the nature, health, and the virtual reality. And the intersections between them, he holds degrees in related fields from Oberlin College, Virginia Tech, and the Yale University. And he has published nearly 50 peer-reviewed scientific articles. His work has earned him an international reputation in the health benefits of nature and the virtual reality as demonstrated by the co-authored journal articles that has been, have been cited in nature, science, uh, PNAS, active uh, act collaborations across 15 countries, and invited plenary talks at the Yale University, Beijing Forestry University, National Taiwan University, United States Forest Service, National Association for State Parks Directors, and elsewhere. I think it's a very important opportunity uh, for us to uh, have this opportunity to learn from uh, Dr. Browning. And uh, I noticed in our audience, there were many established uh, scholars and the very promising young scholars. So it basically is a very good and a very fruitful party. I, I, I totally believe that. Now I will give the time and the floor to Dr. Browning. Thank you, Dr. Browning. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, it's just a total delight to be here. And um, I can echo your, um, I need to echo your appreciation. I've really uh, enjoyed working with you in your lab and your students. Um, in addition to our wider network of people that we work with, it's just really fun to have a critical mass of, of good people that are interested in um, the environment and health and, and psychology and many other things. So it's just really fun to be here and I'm delighted that there's such a good turnout. So thanks for many of you. I know the timing is not great, so I really appreciate your attention today. So with that, I will dive in. Now, my talk title is The Human Health Assessments of Green Infrastructure Designs Using Virtual Reality. And I have to admit that it's somewhat misleading because as been mentioned, my background is not as a designer, but as an environmental manager and environmental scientist. And so I really use green infrastructure designs in VR uh, for largely for therapeutic uses and for advancing theory, rather than um, uh, designing different types of green infrastructure uh, and looking at those health outcomes. Um, there's many, uh, really qualified labs such as uh, uh, the lab that's hosting this uh, seminar series today and, and ones in Thailand and, and the United States uh, that we all work with. So, okay, with that brief caveat, let me dive right in. And my talk is gonna have six different sections to it, uh, which are listed here. So let me dive into the first section here, which is defining what we're talking about with green infrastructure and with virtual reality. Uh, now green infrastructure generally refers to an interconnected network of natural areas that provide ecosystem values and associated benefits. <clears throat> Within a design context and planning context, green infrastructure also refers to smaller but interconnected Vegetated, vegetative elements in outdoor designs. And these can be very familiar, like street trees and parks and open spaces. I apologize, I have a puppy in the background, so that's what the squeaking is. Uh, gardens, parks, median plantings. 
these are familiar types that uh, many of us are familiar with. And then there's also less familiar types of green infrastructure and that would encompass what we're talking about here today, uh, such as green roofs, green walls, rain gardens, bioretention areas, constructed wetlands, and similar uh, forms. The relationship between green infrastructure and DR is that there's a large body of literature, hundreds and hundreds of papers, uh, that's showing that these green infrastructure, let me try to get rid of the sweetie just a second. I had to, this isn't green infrastructure, but uh, obviously it's providing some health benefits for our puppy. All right, so green infrastructure can benefit human health in a number of ways. The problem is that as designers, you would really want your designs to be empirically based. And there's uh, certain different perceptions about these forms of green infrastructure. And you would want to conduct rigorous experimental studies to inform these designs if you're interested in obesity reduction, mental health promotion, et cetera. The problem is that going out and actually constructing these uh, green, goodness, just a second. Hey puppy. All right, we have a pretzel here now. Let's see what the next one is. Okay, the problem is that going outdoors and implementing different types of designs is really difficult. It's expensive. Uh, there's weather constraints, there's travel, there's other compounding factors. So my argument is that VR is a really effective tour, tool for researchers and designers because it's pretty easy to have different iterations of an environment and to show those to people and to look at both their perceptions of the environment as well as the short-term health outcomes. Um, this is a series of images. It's a 360 degree equa rectangular view of an outdoor space with very little vegetation. And then using Photoshop, you can see that there's a variety of different types and densities of trees and shrubs and um, even turf grass. And as I said, the, the skill sets and the time required to do these different iterations is, is relatively small, in fact. Um, and VR, because it's so immersive when typically you put on goggles or a headset, um, it has a very high ecological validity, which means that the user that sees these in VR, their behaviors and perceptions are um, relatively similar to the behaviors and perceptions in the real world. Now there's another uh, power of virtual reality and that related to green infrastructure and nature. And that is, there's a lot of people who can't physically access our designs outdoors in person. Um, however, they would probably benefit from short restorative experiences in a simulated natural environment. So virtual reality goggles are pretty simple to transport and to uh, give to someone. And, uh, and even for a few minutes before they go into a public speaking event, um, or if they live in a very, um, an area with bad air quality, or if they're in a hospital, they're about to see a stress a doctor, if it's bad weather outside, if they're about to take a flight and they have flight anxiety, um, if they live in a very uh, impoverished area with very little green space, um, all these could be contexts in which VR could benefit them since actually having physical and safe access to green infrastructure is difficult. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't define what I'm talking about with virtual reality as well. And there's many different de definitions. Here are a few, a computer generated virtual environment and its associated hardware that provides the users with an illusion of physical presence within that environment or an interactive, immersive, and realistic three-dimensional computer simulated world. Um, I think that the goal of VR is probably more uh, important to focus in on the definition. Um, and the goal is to really suspend people's beliefs in reality and uh, suspend disbelief in the computer-generated reality. In other words, have a high level of what's called presence or feeling like you're virtually in the space that the designer created. And there's two broad categories of VR. 
as I mentioned before, we're really focusing more on goggles, but I will say that there is a room scale VR. This is, this is, these were much more popular uh, when VR was started because goggles were very uncomfortable. And in fact, some of the earliest uh, cave VR environments were at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where I started as a faculty member and where I started this VR lab. And these have a series of short throw reader projected uh, images on this, um, space that has projection screens around it and the user can look in all directions and um, and obviously the designer can uh, project anything they want on the floor the ceiling and all around them and so the user actually can physically walk around that environment without goggles on or with goggles on and and interact with it the problem with this is they're extremely expensive and the technical expertise to set them up is, is quite high. So typically VR now are head mounted displays or HMDs. And you can see here that there's three different categories. One is a phone based where you take a smartphone and use that computing power to um, uh, show the simulation. And then the, the case just has lenses which split it between your two eyes. So you feel like there's some stereo perception. <clears throat> there's computer-based VR, which is where the goggles are tethered or wired to a computer. And so all the computing uh, processing happens on a laptop or a desktop. And then the all-in-one VR, which is where the computer is the GPU, the CPU, uh, the um, hard drive is on the goggles themselves. And uh, our lab, largely focuses on these all-in-one HMDs because you can give them to the user and you don't have to worry about their phone being having a cracked screen or not working and it's just ready to plug and play. Okay, so let's move on to the next section here. Um, I wanna briefly talk about the lab that I run, um, which is called the Virtual Reality and Nature Lab skip that for now. So I, I founded it approximately five years ago, again, at the University of Illinois. And we have two focuses. Uh, the first is conducting basic and applied research on the therapeutic, uh, therapeutic effects of simulated natural environments on human health and well-being. The second focus is looking for ways to evaluate and ultimately enhance the frequency, the richness, the meaningfulness of nature-based connections and interactions. And our big picture vision is a world in which everyone prioritizes safe, accessible nature for our collective health and happiness. Our targeted mission is to develop solutions to societal issues through studying people's experiences with nature, both physical and simulated. We have a large body of spatial epidemiology work um, that's rather than uh, virtual reality work. And we also like to pride ourselves in a positive lab culture. Um, it's one that fosters creativity, um, passion, and intrinsic motivation. Uh, and our lab members appreciate beauty and want to make the world a better place. Um, so the lab consists of a director, a manager, several research assistants and affiliates from our home university, as well as universities across the world. Um, as well as uh, social media and programming interests. And we average about 15 peer reviewed publications a year. Uh, and we have approximately at any given time, we have around $500,000 in active external funding with about $250,000 in annual expenditures. So I want to show a brief promotional video on the lab and I'll do that now. My name is Matthew Browning. I'm the director of the Virtual Reality and Nature Lab and an assistant professor in the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management at Clemson University. The lab applies an interdisciplinary and technological focus to study the interactions and connections between people and the natural world. 
I created the lab in 2016 because I felt there was a need to conduct experimental research on the health benefits resulting from people spending time in nature, and that's almost impossible to do in a controlled fashion outdoors. Today, the lab's mission is to develop solutions to societal issues through stunning people's experiences in nature, both physical and simulated. Students have the opportunity to be involved in a broad array of research projects. We have over 20 going on at any given time. Everything from virtual reality headsets and video production with our Insta360 Pro 2 professional camera to post-production of these 360 videos, psychology research, clinical research, big data, drones, machine learning. The sky's the limit when it comes to the opportunities that students have who are involved in our lab. We are looking for new members in the lab who are passionate, creative, and intrinsically motivated, who appreciate beauty in the world and want to make the world a better place. Okay. My name is Matthew Browning. Oops. I'm the George. So our lab's located in the southeastern United States. You can see it's close to Atlanta, uh, Charlotte, Columbia, and it's in a very temperate climate. Um, I've been going out mountain biking now, even though it's November, um, which in most places in the United States, it's very gray and cold right now, which is lovely. And we're on a, located on a very lovely campus, Clemson University, which is just a Carnegie Mellon Research One University, uh, which is based off of the external grant dollars coming in and peer reviewed publications. We're housed in a department of parks, recreation and tourism management, which is highly productive. Um, we have approximately 40 uh, faculty members and our average per faculty member uh, uh, output for manuscripts is uh, about nine publications a year. That's what it was last year. And we're also located in this really lovely area. Okay, so we have um, approximately 100 waterfalls within a one hour drive of the campus. Um, and there's many uh, beautiful mountains and other natural resources. Uh, and those interested in urban design were also located at approximately 40 minutes from Greenville, which is a very, has a very interesting um, uh, downtown area that's mixing both green and built infrastructure. Oh, and the last thing is our, our university has the largest contiguous public forest of any university across the United States. It's approximately 70,000 or 70 uh, square kilometers that's surrounding our forest that's all run by the university. And it's full of trails and lakes and it's uh, very nice for outdoor recreation. Okay, so the next part of my talk is I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna have two case studies of our research and then three extensions that are ongoing that go beyond just uh, green infrastructure and, and virtual reality. And I'll wrap up for questions. So the first case study is a published meta-analysis um, with um, many, of the, many of my friends and colleagues, including uh, the environmental psychologist, Terry Hardig. So let me briefly talk about the mechanisms by which nature, more broadly speaking, um, might benefit health and in particular uh, mood. So this is from our colleague Jana Markovic um, in her many, many, many cited uh, 2017 publication. And this suggests that there's three uh, domains of pathways by which nature improves health. One is through mitigating harms. Another is through instauration, which would be building capacities through social interaction physical activity and other health promoting behaviors. And then the third pathway is restoring capacities uh, through attention or uh, uh, cognitive functioning. Now, what we propose in this uh, paper when we're, what we're doing is we're com directly comparing actual and simulated nature to see how well simulated nature does. Um, we propose that the effects should be quite smaller for a simulated natural environment than actually going outdoors. And that's because there's only one of these mechanisms at play, which is the restoration domain. But I don't want to uh, downplay the importance of a restoration domain. So this is uh, a 
recently published review article in Computers and Behavior, Computers and Human Behavior uh, by myself and some uh, colleagues from Finland. And this shows that there's a number of different restoration uh, processes that can be played with simulated nature from physi uh, physiological restoration activated through Ulrich stress reduction theory to effective restoration, cognitive restoration, social restoration, ecological restoration, and transcendent restoration. And I recommend, I'm not gonna get into each of these um, here today out of time, but I'd recommend everyone read this really nice review that Tomi uh, led. Okay, so the current study, again, it's, it's a meta-analysis, so it means it's using the pooled effects of other people's studies to compare the effects of actual and simulated nature on human health and well-being. And we did follow best practices, the PRISMA guidelines. So the first process was figuring out what health outcome we were going to look at. It, it was tricky to do because <laughs> there's not a lot of papers that have rigorously compared going outdoors and putting on a headset or other types of simulations. Um, so the outcome had to be sensitive to a short term exposure to uh, green infrastructure or nature more broadly. But that outcome over time would have had to cumulatively uh, affect health in lasting ways. Um, and the changes uh, would have had to result from either type of exposure, simulated or actual. So a mitigation domain um, probably wouldn't work as well. Uh, and we identified that uh, positive and negative mood met these criteria. So we, we actually restricted our studies to those that use the positive and negative affect um, schedule with a PANIS before and after exposure. And it's nice because that selection of mood for our outcome builds off of one of the only other previous review studies that compare simulated nature and actual nature uh, from 2015. Okay, so our, our articles were largely selected actually from a different review paper that we published in Environment and Behavior um, that looked over 200, it, it systematically looked through all the simulated nature studies we could find, um, which was, uh, I, think, I believe, about 200. Um, and some of those we found <clears throat> directly compared actual and simulated nature. So that's where our search began. Uh, but we also uh, looked for unpublished data through a number of listservs, professional listservs. The inclusion criteria for articles were Participants had to be exposed to at least one simulated natural setting. This could be a photograph, a slideshow, video, or an immersive virtual environment like a VR headset. The simulation had to be the same or very similar to the actual setting used in the same study. Again, we used the PANIS. It had to be administered before and after exposure. And then the duration of the exposure had to be similar. We extracted the data from each of these articles independently and resolved any disagreements through consensus, but our inner rate or reliability for the data extraction was 100%, so it wasn't an issue. And then the actual outcome we looked at was the change, the standardized mean difference scores, or people call it just the change scores. You can see the equation here, but in effect, uh, what we are looking at was how much let's say positive mood changed from before exposure to nature versus after. And then we compared those effects between simulated and uh, actual nature. And here's our flow chart for data exclusion. You can see we found um, about 15,000 records and only in four, six articles qualified. So there needs to be much more research on this. But here are those articles. Um, they're from Canada, Norway, Iceland, Italy, Finland, and the United States. I was really thrilled actually that there, there was a broader representation, albeit missing uh, studies from China and elsewhere in Asia. But I was very glad that they weren't all from the UK and the US, uh, which is common in other reviews of, of environmental epidemiology, for example. Um, so you can see the simulation durations range from 
uh, about five minutes to 40 minutes and participant sample size range from in the 20s to all the way up to 80. And here are a few images from those selected studies. Okay, so what we found was that actual nature, so going outdoors and experiencing the forest improved positive moods more than virtual nature. This is uh, a forest pot and that diamond on the bottom is what you wanna focus on. And that is to the right of the uh, uh, vertical line, which means that physical nature uh, had a larger positive impact on feeling good and happy and uh, other types of positive moods then did simulated nature and the effect was quite large. The uh, changes in negative affect were uh, not statistically different between actual and simulated nature. The diamond was crossing that dotted line, uh, which is just that there's, when you pull the facts, there's, there's no difference between um, changes in feeling bad uh, from going outside and let's say putting on a headset. Okay, so to summarize, there was a large difference in the effects of actual nature and simulated nature on positive mood. There was a little difference in these two exposures on negative mood. And that means the available data indicates that going outdoors is likely better at supporting mood than remaining indoors. The implication is that, um, Oh, let me let me jump to this one. There are certain contexts where simulations of nature might still be beneficial, um, but in general, we we hesitate to recommend it be a replacement by any means for actually going out and developing green infrastructure and encouraging people to go out to those places. Um, but simulations can be used in places like hospitals and prisons, where social and in the context where social distancing is necessary. Simulations may also be safer for certain therapeutic modalities, such as people with allergies, infectious disease, accidental injury, um, COPD. And then one benefit of, of VR is a clinician who's prescribing, you know, part prescriptions, for example, they would have greater control over what the actual intervention would be for their patients if they were using a simulation. And simulations are also very practical. They can be safely and quickly moved from one person to another. I'm just looking at the clock, so I'm skipping some slides here. Um, there were many limitations to the study. Obviously, we had a very modest number of studies. There was high levels of between study variation for, in particular, for negative affect. Uh, we only looked at one indicator of mood. Um, and importantly, none of the experiments, including experiments, uh, induced stress or mental fatigue before exposure. So they weren't actually looking at restoration um, per se, they were just looking at changes in mood over exposure. Uh, and in fact, from past literature, uh, some populations like prisoners might even find that simulations of outdoors can only remind them of the constraints they can't escape. So uh, you do have to be cognizant of that. Okay, so case study number two, and I'm gonna rapidly move through this. You can see my colleagues here. So this started two years ago when I was three years ago when I was at uh, University of Illinois, and we identified this gap in the literature that uh, there needs to be uh, the longitudinal effects of repeated exposure to virtual nature needs to be studied, particularly in the context of mental health. Uh, there were very few studies, even of actual nature, that looked at longitudinal effects, and so. Our central research question for this study, which is ongoing, um, data analysis ongoing, I'm sorry, is does repeated exposure to virtual nature enhance mental health treatment? And we conducted actually two different pilot studies. We worked with a professional photographer and videographer to retrieve over 50 um, different natural settings from around the world. And we first evaluated the restorativeness um, uh, across all those studies. And then we also looked at how long each of the scenes should be played back in a headset before people got bored and wanted to take it off. 
And in to summarize all of this, we um, we found that about a four minute video was um, almost everyone felt like a four minute video was a good length of time. They got some beneficial effects, but it wasn't too long. And also people liked transitions every minute. So a uh, landscape would transition uh, from one to the next after a minute. And they could explore each video for one minute before it transitioned to the next. So um, what we actually used in the larger study were um, these images I show here. One is, is of an aspen forest. One is of beaches with sunsets. One is with green pastures and trees. Another one with forests and moving freshwater. Another is with trees with covered with moss. Uh, this is from a rainforest setting. And the last is uh, water bodies with a high uh, level of prospect. Okay, I'm gonna move beyond this. Okay, and this brings us to the, the larger study that I alluded to. And um, what we did was we sent headsets home with participants for a month and asked them to look at these videos every day over the course of a month. And we were looking at changes in anxiety and depression in this non-clinical sample, as well as um, risk factors for anxiety and depression to see if that's the mechanism by which virtual nature might impact mental illness. Uh, in particular, we are looking at low levels of uh, reflection, high levels of rumination, and low levels of uh, positive emotion, high levels of negative emotion. And this was called the Tavern Project. So these results are uh, not published, so please, uh, they're not for sharing at this time. These very preliminary findings suggest that repeated exposures to nature may improve mood, reduce anxiety and depression, much more research needs to be done and even more research with this data set needs to be done. Um, and another th conclusion is that headsets might be administered uh, at home for patients or students with limited exposure to, to nature. Okay, so now we're gonna get into three extensions of this topic and let me just check my time. So it's 6.42 and I feel like I should be talking for what, another 10 minutes? Can you remind so me? It's okay, just take your time. Okay, okay, we okay we perfect. Strict okay, lovely. Um, that's good to hear because this part is not just me talking. You guys get to watch some uh, interesting videos. So I wanna take a bigger picture of you now. Um, that was really focused on restorative natural environments. And I wanna show you how VR might be, um, green infrastructure in VR uh, might, help um, bigger picture issues in society. Um, and here are three ways, through psychotherapy, behavior change, and education. So let me first talk about psychotherapy. Uh, we have a project with a number of clinical psychologists, as well as um, uh, cancer clinicians who are working with uh, people with late stage cancer who experience very high levels of pain because of their chemotherapy, as, um, as well as uh, other social and, behavior, uh, social and behavior triggers when you're living with cancer in our late stage. And one effective way to um, not just distract people from that pain, but to actually retrain the brain so it doesn't feel the pain as strongly is through psychotherapy. So you go in and, um, or you can listen to, to tapes from your psychologist that uh, is walking you through this visualization process. Uh, for example, going from a, a hard, rocky surface to a smooth uh, surface or going through a doorway and you feel like you are moving beyond um, the narrative around living with cancer pain to a better quality of life. And this the idea is that it's actually retraining the, your limbic system so you're not emotionally responding to the pain. And I'm really excited about using VR for this because there's many studies that are decades old that are really using VR for distraction therapy for pain. And we're trying to combine it with sort of state-of-the-art um, psychological uh, techniques beyond, beyond distraction. So we're, we're, we developed this VR model. It does have green infrastructure, of course, um, but it combines the psychologist voice. And this uh, will be Again, put on headsets, sent home with patients 
uh, and then we'll be measuring pain and opioid use and other measures. Um, but here's just a one minute clip of what we hope to do. There's a sense of strength, a sense of peace that you feel. And there is that stream that's flowing along and you can hear the water, the sound of a waterfall as you notice that and the waterfall getting louder and louder and louder and louder. You can hear the roar of the water cascading. What seemed to be gentle moments ago, now that flow of the water just cascading and flowing. And you can see it there, the waterfall in front of you. And you notice that it's a, see, in fact, it's effortless in your mind to just make that sound louder and louder and louder and louder. But you can almost turn it down, almost as if you have a remote control in your hand. And you could hit that volume button. And you notice that you can make the sound quieter and quieter. So you can see some of the, the guided imagery visualization processes with that uh, transcription of the person talking uh, and how that might allow someone to move beyond pain. And this could be used obviously for other outcomes as well beyond pain. But again, the, the big picture is to combine some of the, the visual aspects of green infrastructure with what's really leading in psychology treatments. Um, and obviously you can do things like distraction therapy and mindfulness training, but there's, there's other things that are really cutting edge, which are pretty powerful um, that can be combined in VR uh, to make a really fun uh, intervention that people would actually adhere to. All right, so another arena would be behavior change. Um, with, uh, with the changing climate and pe some people's uh, and uh, some areas uh, resistance to believing in climate change or you know, many, many barriers to, in uh, to investing in green infrastructure, it's important for people to be able to really feel the effects of climate change rather than just reading about it in the news or uh, getting information and virtual reality can do that. You can really feel what it would be like to experience uh, climate change. And we have a uh, funded project doing just that. This is with um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration, NOAA. And we are looking at storm surge events along the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. So. I show you to all those pictures of our lovely campus that's up in the mountains, but actually the, the state that we live in goes all the way out to the coast and we have very nice beaches out there. So we are uh, developing, these are all prototypes, by the way, these are not uh, polished products. So I apologize that they're rough on the edges. Um, we're developing a VR simulation to show to local governments uh, how much green infrastructure or other sorts of interventions could help protect their communities from storm surge events and other climate change events, okay? So this is, I think, maybe a four minute video. Um, and it's, this is the, the main interventions that shows here are uh, raising a home so it doesn't get flooded as well as getting flood insurance. We are expanding that to actually incorporate dune restoration, uh, a marsh restoration and other forms of green infrastructure. So this is a very early prototype, but I'll let you watch. You have just purchased a home near a beautiful coastal area. Let's take a look inside. Now take a look around your home. It took a lot of effort to set things up, but now it's your own space. While you were busy moving in, the rain and the wind is picked up outside. This is an ABC News update. Hurricane Irma. Now reporting, David Muir. Good evening from Naples tonight, where you can see the conditions beginning to worsen as we speak. Already the water's churning here out in the ocean, and it is pouring now here in Naples a full 24 hours uh, before the eye of this hurricane is expected to be right over Naples. They're expecting winds of 100 miles per hour or more. Powerful Last winds aren't the only deadly force during a hurricane. The greatest threat to life actually comes from the water in the form of a storm surge. Storm surge is water from the ocean that is pushed towards the shore by the force of winds swirling around the hurricane. 
This wind-driven water has tremendous power. One cubic yard of seawater weighs 1,728 pounds, almost a ton. The advancing surge combines with the normal tides and can increase the water level by 30 feet or more. In life, you don't get do-overs. But in this experience, you can get a second chance. Let's go back in time and prepare for the hurricane ahead of time. Use your controller to elevate your home and construct a new foundation underneath. One of the most recommended ways of preparing for flooding and storm surges is to elevate your home to a required or flood protection elevation. When a house is properly elevated, the living area will be above all but the most severe floods. When the house is lifted and a foundation is built below, the living area is raised and only the foundation remains exposed to flooding. To ensure maximum protection, you will elevate your house a full story. You can use the space below the elevated house for parking, storage, or building access. Flood insurance can be the difference between recovering and being financially devastated. Just one inch of water in a home can cost more than $25,000 in damage. Without flood insurance, most residents have to pay out of pocket or take out loans to repair and replace damaged items. With flood insurance, you're able to recover faster and more fully. To prepare for the next flooding incident, you will be purchasing flood insurance by signing your name on the policy statement with your controller. Now, let's move back into your elevated and flood insured home. Use your controller to teleport into the home. This time, your house is elevated, so it will be above water level. Your house is likely to stay dry during and after the hurricane. You are also covered with flood insurance, so you will receive financial support for water damage. But there are unforeseen circumstances that can still have serious negative consequences. For instance, the storm surge can easily sweep a boat from the coastal area into a wall of your home. Your neighbors and other buildings that did not elevate their structure ahead of time will be submerged you are likely to be isolated. So, even if you have elevated your home, purchased flood insurance, and taken other precautionary measures for the upcoming hurricane, these will only provide long-term protection. For your immediate safety and survival, it is extremely important that you follow governmental recommendations and evacuation announcements. Visit ready.gov slash hurricane. All right, so again, the interventions here are, we're changing those. Uh, to incorporate more green infrastructure since elevating houses is a very expensive. Um, and you can imagine this sort of uh, VR intervention that involves uh, you experience some climate change event and then you can go back in time and make modifications to, to your own residential environment or to a community um, and then replay that uh, climate change model and see and feel that uh, it would have an effect. So we're writing a proposal now to do just that in communities across the United States where community leaders can see the impact of climate change under con uh, different uh, scenarios on their urban uh, tree canopy. And in general, you know, there's, there's gonna be a loss of tree canopy cover more than there has been in the past. But if they go back and they invest in trees, they can see them grow. They can literally in VR, you can feel the, uh, or you think that you can feel the reduction in the heat island effect when you're in the shade. Um, you can hear reductions in traffic noise. You can see reductions in air pollution um, and so on and so forth. So I think this, this uh, you know, before and after scenario uh, is a really powerful uh, technique for behavior change. And the last uh, extension I wanna talk about is, the context here is totally different than what we've been talking about, 
but it's it's at a very professional level and i'm going to relate it to what we're talking about after we watch a portion of this film uh, this is called 116 cameras it was made by the new york times and others so let me watch may, let me show about five minutes and then i'll uh, tell you how it relates to the to what we're talking about here today Three, two, one, go ahead. Okay. My name is Eva Schloss. Would you like to ask me some questions about my life? Why don't you ask me a question about Auschwitz? Why don't you ask me a question about Auschwitz? Everybody said, never again Auschwitz, we have learned our lesson. But it looked bad again in the world, the hatred, discrimination. So I thought it really necessary to teach and to speak about it. Pinchas Guter. I will answer any questions you might have for me. How old were you when the war ended? I was between the ages of 13 and 14 when the war ended in 1945. But he, he doesn't move much, really. And that's, that's his choice. Well, it's very Jewish to talk with your hands. Yes, <laughs> it is. And you should feel comfortable to do. And, and you can. Exactly. You can. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be somewhat normal mm. in a hundred years' time to have a person sitting in, in this position, and it won't seem as unnatural. Mm -hmm. when, when you start to get into the questions and you start to get into the dialogue, you kind of lose sight of the fact that the person's not actually there. This is Andrew. Yes. Hi, Andrew. Hey, nice to you. meet you. Lisa. And this is Lisa, her granddaughter. Right now, there's about 100 cameras on the stage. So we're recording everything in all directions. The idea behind the green is that we can then take out the green and replace it with any other environment that you're going to be talking in the future. So this could be a classroom, it could be a museum, and we can put those backdrops behind you. In the beginning, I didn't know really how to speak. You know, it's, it's something you have to learn. Eventually, I found my own voice. OK, here we go. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm feeling very well, a little nervous. Okay. When did you first start telling your story? Since 1986, I started to speak for the first time and I haven't really stopped since. Today is October the 9th, 1996. The survivor being interviewed is Eva Schloss, maiden name Geringer. I realized suddenly that people are interested and people do want to know about it. And this was really a big turning point in my life. This is a repeat after me. 
My name is Eva Schloss and I'm a Holocaust survivor. My name is Eva Schloss, I'm a Holocaust survivor. I'm actually a recording, so I can't answer that question. I'm actually a recording, I can't answer that question. I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe you should try to reboot. Maybe you should try to... Reboot. Rebook. Re reboot. Reboot. Okay, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Too uh, technical for me. Okay. What a what a sweet lady. So this is uh, this is called a Dimensions in Testimony project, and there's 160 cameras around this spherical green screen, and it allows um, Holocaust educators to um, record the very few survivors of the Holocaust left and project them into um, onto television monitors, but then also into 3D holographic imagery and into virtual reality environments. And our lab uh, was recently funded to evaluate the effects of these different immersive technologies in Holocaust education. And the as, as the as the one of the um, uh, producers mentioned there, this probably is going to become increasingly common, and I think this could relate to green infrastructure and um, other societal issues by allowing us to capture the stories of people that grew up in times when the world was very different, for example, um, in uh, Pacific Island countries uh, before uh, the sea, before hopefully not, but before sea level rise and, and capture these in ways that future generations can interact with these participants. So in this green screen, they record thousands of questions and answers from these participants. And then when you interact in VR or through a 3D holographic image, you can ask them any number of questions and they, the voice recognition uh, recognizes what you're asking. And then the, um, in this case, the Holocaust survivor responds. And so you can have this interactive dialogue. And I think this would be a very powerful way to edu educate people about environmental issues, societal issues moving forward, um, particularly in VR. So um, with that, I'm going to conclude and, and wrap up. And I really look forward to hopefully some good uh, discussion with you all next. So in conclusion, I, I wanted to bring out this <laughs> really neat article uh, from science in 1973 that's called Plastic Trees, What's Wrong with Plastic Trees? And it starts off with this quote by a, um, he was a California um, a governor, I believe, uh, nominee, um, but then he was later uh, the United States president, Ronald Reagan. And he said, a tree is a tree. How many more redwoods do you need to look at? If you've seen one, you've seen them all. And this, um, uh, Krieger, the, the, the article um, author, was talking about, well, if simulations could just be replacing these actual rare natural environments, then should we be concerned about that? Do we need to be concerned about simulations um, replacing people's uh, care for preserving and designing green infrastructure? And um, that's a natural fear. Um, decision makers might say, well, we live in this virtual world, you know, ready player one, and we don't need to worry about actually having physical green infrastructure because we can make even better stuff in the VR space. And I would argue, and actually ultimately this, this author argues almost 50 years ago that no, we don't have to be concerned about simulations. Um, they can be actually a really useful tool. Uh, this this notion of simulations replacing reality reality um, has some bearing, but for the time being, VR, as I've shown here, tried to show here, can be very good at developing empathy, emotional responses, uh, interactivity with places and people that are long gone. Um, and so, I highly recommend that you know all the attendees. Uh, uh, start to use VR in their research and practice. So with that, I will just provide some resources and uh, uh, references here. Uh, so this QR code uh, should go to the uh, a list of references on 
our work in, in VR as well as our work on, on nature and health more broadly. Uh, I encourage uh, everyone to follow our lab at Clemson BRN Lab on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And I do wanna acknowledge the many mentors that I've had, um, Bill Stewart, Bill Sullivan, Mark Stern, Stephen Kellert, Jeff Marion, uh, Cheryl Charles, Tim Gregoire, Ming Kuo, Wendy Heller, and many others, as well as our grant support for our lab from the US Forest Service, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, from our home university, Clemson University, from our clinical partners, Prisma Healthcare, Carl Hospital, uh, from my former institution, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, from the NIH, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, uh, from other land management agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, and many others. And then finally, we have really good students, and I want to fit, you know, dozens of them here, but I do want to call out in particular our lab manager, Olivia. Uh, she's fantastic. If you get involved with our lab, you will be corresponding with Olivia many, many times, as well as our um, our research assistants and affiliates, uh, Sanak, Shrai, Kaylin, Katie, and many others. So with that, thank you for your attention. Um, I hope the Christmas decoration isn't too early in the season, but there you go. My kids are excited about it. So I will end the show. And actually, I'll just go back. Well, yeah, I'll end the show so we can see each other here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Browning. It's a fascinating uh, speech. Um, especially you shared some most latest uh, study. I think it's very informative uh, for our uh, research and uh, teaching. And I would uh, remind the, our uh, working team to don't share this on, on the, as a video on the internet uh, you know, for that unpublished part. So uh, I already sent the invitation through the chat box for all the audiences and they can print the questions in the chat box now you have chance to see that i have to see uh, i have to say the very professional <laughs> questions you probably yes will take take a few minutes to answer that but anyway yes. I, I want to give a, a, a little privilege to the uh, faculty members and the students from the hku and uh, if uh, you have any question please ask orally and then we will go through the questions in the chat box, okay? Thank you. Okay. So just speak up, okay? Turn on your, your Mac. Yeah. Being, should, should I start? Yeah, yeah, please. Ashley is, uh, is our colleague, and actually he's my neighbor. <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> just he's right behind me, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, okay, this is, uh, th thank you, Matthew, for, for the talk. This is, I, I never watch anything like this. Uh, I, and I don't engage this literature at all. I'm as far away from psychology, probably, as you possibly could be. Um, but uh, I was having a class this morning on uh, uh, talking to students, uh, discussing advanced technologies in general. Um, so I, I think I can draw a little bit of, of line of connection here. But again, this is really far outside of the things that I, I work on. Uh, and I don't pay nearly enough attention to uh, advancements in things like human simulations. Um, I'm mostly focused on environmental simulations and their political consequences. Uh, so <laughs> um, I, I wanna ask a question about where you see these technologies going and not, not related to the metaverse or any of those kinds of things uh, that I, I think you are probably trying to push as many of those questions away as possible. Um, but it's, it's really in about um, where do you, like there's a lot of, there are experts that are crafting these simulations like yourself or uh, others that you're consulting that are designing green infrastructure and environments uh, and, and things like that. Um, and they have, a, there, there's a distance between the users that you're 
uh, that are that are in these simulations and that will be in the future as the technology becomes uh, more widespread. And I, I'm 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 concerned about that distance. I'm concerned about the um, that, that experts. Uh, could be increasingly detached from the contexts that they are actually intervening in by creating these simulations. Um, and then that's the, the same thing is true for um, environmental sensing technologies um, and uh, automated ways of evaluating and intervening in the real environment. Um, so you know, not just only the, the simulations. Um, and that in, in all of the cases that I was talking with students this morning, um, the deployment of the advanced technologies were outstripping the institutional frameworks for its governance. Um, so I, I'm, I was wondering if, if at all, and you, maybe the answer is just no, but do you consider um, these things when you're scoping the, the work that you do, or is this something maybe you have coffee table discussions <laughs> about it or something like that? Um, that that's all. Uh, so the answer is yes, we do as much as possible. Um, from my experience, it's, it's, it's very in time intensive to do it well. Um, obviously, you can do focus groups. I mean, uh, for the, the climate change storm surge scenario, for example, we're doing focus groups at conferences with the people who would be using these, um, just like any industry would do, and then we go back and revise it. But um, I think that there's one really nice example to do it well um, that our lab is running now. It's actually Olivia's dissertation and it's with um, people with uh, COPD. So they um, there are health risks associated with them going to actual nature. Um, and it involves five different Zoom visits with them to first collect, you ask them to collect um, photographs and stories of memorable times in green spaces. And then you go out and you actually create the uh, virtual environments based off of what they, they sent you. And then you go and show them and they decide what they want to see and how long they want to see it, what the company soundscape is, so on and so forth. And then they record uh, their stories of their past experiences before they had COPD in these spaces. And they have this archived uh, narrative of uh, their life prior to COPD moving forward that they can then share um, with their family members and their caregivers and watch themselves uh, to sort of rethink that narrative, what their life is all about. Um, but again, that's very intensive. You know, this is a dissertation project, I think, with five individuals. Um, so, you know, three year process. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. It's a concern, and I think that um, with more uh, resources, there could be more uh, time devoted to actually working with users beyond what we're doing now. It's a great, great question. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> any question from HKU uh, people? So, Dr. Brown, you know, maybe let's let's go through the uh, the questions uh, people typed in the chat box. Do, do you mind to share your screen so all the people can see the questions yeah. in the chat box? Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there are around five questions. We probably were closed at uh, eight thirty, so uh, just just uh, uh, relax and try to uh, answer. Okay. As many as you can. Okay. Before time. Okay. So, have you considered um, adding different sensory experiences such as smell, texture to your simulated setting? I think it would think, make a difference. I think, sorry, I, sorry. I think the screen is wrong. You know, so you have. You to know what, Ben? I wonder yeah. if Zoom hides the chat box. It may. Yeah. When I share my screen, it I have the. Um, mm -hmm. Can you see it now? Uh, maybe I, I can share my screen, okay? So you can... Yeah, can what, let's try that. Yeah, it might okay. be sort of like the the faces are hidden as well when you share your screen. So the Zoom specific windows are hidden. We can, yes. we can see. 
guess. Um, and if it doesn't work, we could just copy the questions into a Word document. Okay. Yes, I do. I do have the same problem as you have. <laughs> yes. Maybe I just read those questions. Maybe. Or you can read the questions if you don't mind. Um, I've got an idea. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, wonderful. Okay. That's great. So the first question was about adding different sensory experiences, such as smell and texture. Um, we have done that, and I am very interested in doing more of it. Uh, for example, we have one study that's in a cave VR environment that's under review that used, literally we got the uh, scent of dirt <laughs> as well as different types of natural elements. And we are looking explicitly on the unique effects of having, actually, I can just describe the study more broadly. Um, so I am right next to a window right now and I actually have the window open, which is a little bit chilly at this early morning. Um, and because I have the window open, I can hear where we live right next to a forest. Um, I can hear the sounds of the creature, the animals waking up as well as um, there is some, uh, there is some scent that I can, I can perceive, but then there's also, um, you know, other very small uh, things, viruses, bacteria, and other things coming in from the outdoors, which can have an impact. So uh, we had a, an experiment where we compare the effects of uh, being in a setting on um, and having a window or not having a window as well as having that window open. Uh, and again, this was one of those cave virtual reality environments. And when the windows open, again, you don't just have views of green space, but you have um, the smells of green space coming in and the sounds. And we did find that those sounds and smells had a larger impact on uh, perceived restoration than having the window closed. So, um, you know, I think it extends beyond smell and texture. Again, I mentioned uh, microorganisms. There's also uh, different wavelengths that can have an effect. Um, obviously, people are familiar with blue light, with seasonal affective disorder, but then there's uh, red light and near infrared light, which is particularly strong at sun sunsets. Um, and that can do a whole host of um, activate a whole host of beneficial physiological um, processes in the body, uh, including, in, including creating ATP. Um, so people actually spend quite a bit of money on replicating the sunlight uh, uh, for biohacking, for example. So uh, yes, I think it would make a difference. Um, it's hard to do without it being awkward for the participant to be, for example, these uh, light panels, you know, having them hover around their body. Um, but we need to figure out how to do that better. Uh, thank you for the excellent speech. Thank you for attending and thanks for your kind words. Uh, small question about the experiment. Uh, I think that's probably the longitudinal study. Were there any cases in which respondents felt uncomfortable or giddy when they were wearing the HMDs? If so, how should we deal with the pr uh, problem? Um, so we have had less than 1% of our participants and we've you know, used thousands of participants, over a thousand participants in an HMD. Um, less than 1%, probably less than 0.1% um, uh, have cyber sickness or um, have discomfort with a short duration of exposure. Um, so there's reviews on what causes uh, people to feel uncomfortable in VR as well as to get cyber sick or motion sick. And we just avoid those things. So one of them is you don't have the move if you're using 360 degree videos um, you have them, or, or virtual environments, you have them teleport rather than physically walk around. Um, another one is you don't have them wear the headset for 15 minutes or something like that. There are certainly people that, gamers in particular, that can do that, but many people don't. 
So those are our techniques uh, for dealing with um, discomfort. Sorry, excuse, and, me, excuse me, uh, Matt. Yeah. Uh, actually, the question is from was from Felix. The Xiao Yu Mao's question is is listed underneath this man or her name. Oh, yeah, yeah. right here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah so this pertains but, to this. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, limitation of the meta analysis. There's a sentence only pre and post condition measures of PANIS were used. Are there other time points that need to be measured during the, uh, I think that's probably during the uh, outdoor treatments. Um, yes, there is. Um, the reason that the studies we included only had pre and post exposure. Um, was in part because there was no, as I mentioned, stress or attention uh, um, depletion. And obviously, if you do that, then you have to have baseline so you can see whether, you know, the trier social stress task or whatever you're using is having an effect. Um, for mood states, yes, you could look at longer term. Um, so you could have them sit in the room and, and see if there's, there's changes. But the PANIS that was used in these studies was, um, state level panis um and that's you know i don't know the relevance of having someone sit in a waiting room for 45 minutes after an experiment and then measuring state level panis again because by definition it's a fleeting you know um it's a fle fleeting uh state um but i need to think more about it clearly physiological measures would be important um and those you could uh, do throughout a study. And in fact, one of the studies that's included in there um, had skin conductivity measured throughout the exposure. Uh, so that would be my answer for now for that question. Very happy to talk about it more. I wanna try to get to each of these and there's some longer ones, some good ones here. Thank you. Uh, I've read several articles. I'm thrilled to hear that. I like your work. Give me a lot of inspiration. That's wonderful. I have a question about the comparisons between virtual nature and real nature experience. As one mode of exposure, virtual nature might not be as effective because the real nature experience is richer. Um, I would agree because of all those mechanisms that can be activated by going outdoors. Um, yeah, people can free, move freely in the sunshine and the comfortable breeze. I think it's not very compare. Uh, fair to compare these two types of exposures with the same scenes, because theoretically we can use the best nature scenes for people using VR. Absolutely agree. But real nature experiences only include those that are accessible. Um, second, when carrying out experiments in real nature, the subjects have to walk to the targeted scenes. During this process, the exposure already began. So the temporary dose of the group are actually stronger than the virtual reality group. What's your opinion on these two aspects? Um, I completely agree with the first part. Um, the virtual nature experience can be, um, it can be fine tuned for any type of outcome. Um, it could be a social restoration experience as well outdoors. Um, whereas that would be very hard to just make happen <laughs> in the real world. Um, the second part of the question about walking. So one of the included studies, in fact, drove people to a uh, panoramic vista of the Italian Alps. And when they got there, they had them sit in a chair um, and either put on a headset and see that scene or not have a headset and view that scene uh, in real life. So that limitation can be overcome. Um, uh, I can say that in other studies, um, that's not the case. So yes, that's a limitation and uh, the exposure has lengthened. There's also the, um, the uh, obviously you are engaging in some low level physical activity. Uh, you are physically distancing yourself from a place. So for example, if you conduct a VR experiment on campus, then, you know, that's very much, um, it may be harder to be psychologically away from your everyday routines. Um, I will say though that 
having people walk in nature before they sit down and have that as be their forest bathing or whatever you want to call it isn't totally um, misleading because that's part of an outdoor nature experience. So yes, they can't be directly compared, but if you are comparing the benefits of mailing someone a headset with restorative videos or asking them to go walk in their local park, that's kind of the, in, the two interventions that you could think of. So there's still some value even in studies that didn't more rigorously control those you know, extended durations or physical activity. I hope that makes sense. Great question. Um, have you compared the different effects of different natural environment uh, features on people's emotions? How do you extract the spatial characteristics of green infrastructure? Okay, so two-part question. Um, so this is, um, at the beginning of the talk, I, um, I, I admitted that I am not a designer by training. I'm a manager. I used to be a park ranger. Uh, my background's in forestry and environmental studies. So I think more about it in terms of management um, than uh, different types of designs. Uh, that said, yes, we're very interested in different types of elements. And um, again, whether it's street trees or um, turf grass or uh, flowers, so on and so forth. A lot of our work doing that has actually been in observational studies. Um, and one really exciting um, uh, example of that is there is this fantastic actual randomized controlled trial happening in Louisville, Kentucky. It's called the Green Heart Project. And there's about $8 million US of urban greening happening in case controlled environments where the green neighborhood has a very similar sociodemographic neighborhood that's not green nearby. And this is a longitudinal study that uh, the, the PI is looking particularly at cardiovascular health and we're sort of leading the mental health benefits of that study. And we have used uh, this uh, really neat um, algorithm to separate out both the types and the locations of different types of green elements such as trees, uh, turf, shrubs, and then also the stratification of those things um, using street view images. Uh, so whether it's just high up or whether it's um, green all the way up to the sky. Um, and we're also looking at uh, in public and private spaces. So is it in someone's front yard where everyone can access it to it and in street uh, in medians versus backyards or private lots where not everyone can physically access those spaces. Um, so the results of that are pending, but you know the larger body of literature suggests that, and, and, and this is where I stand right now, if I had to urban green solely for health benefits, not for other ecosystem services, I would do two things. I would do canopy trees and I would do gardens <laughs> because canopy trees covers those mitigation, aesthetics, restoration, um, social cohesion through shade and other things they're just fantastic. And then the other thing, gardening is activating, again, all those pathways, uh, low levels of physical activity, social interaction, um, exposure to microbiota, um, uh, you know, and there's all sorts of other things associated with gardening. We have a paper that should be published soon that shows that families who garden have richer gut microbiomes than those who don't. And regardless of whether the kids in the family are gardening themselves. So if you have one parent who's gardening, the kids have healthier gut microbiomes. And obviously there's confounding effects here, um, but it does suggest that, uh, that it's sort of like if you have a pet in the house, you get those collateral, collateral benefits throughout a household. So canopy trees and gardens is what I'd recommend. And the extracting spatial characteristics, you know, the standard suite of machine learning and uh, uh, LIDAR to, to determine the, um, both the density and the height of different vegetative characteristics. I'm happy to go into those more, um, but that's my brief answer for now. And then got 50 seconds for the last one. Most studies are focusing on binary comparisons, urban versus rural. I totally agree. 
How do you think about if we compare different elements that are all beautiful or a series of environments that change gradually from totally urban, totally nature? Um, I think it's great. Obviously, uh, Ben's lab has done some of the fundamental work on, for example, different canopy cover uh, densities. Uh, and there is there does seem like there might be a threshold um, around 30% where it plateaus or even decreases. Uh, so I think more work is needed. To be honest, this whole field of nature health is so uh, in, it, in, in, in its infancy compared to other environmental exposures like air pollution that we need more research on all of these things. Um, so that's that's my brief answer and I'm out of time. So I'll, I'll quit for now, but I'm happy to discuss offline uh, with anybody else. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think this is a, Although this is a short uh, event, uh, compared to uh, so many questions, actually, I personally have some questions. Maybe I can ask later. <laughs> with, uh, yeah, well, I'm happy three. to stay on for a few too, uh, a few yeah. more minutes as well. Yeah, I do, I do have a, uh, a broad question. Maybe it's a, I, I do think uh, it's important and many uh, our colleagues and students also uh, have this uh, similar concern. Uh, you may notice the Facebook has changed to the name Meta, and then which means uh, uh, the Facebook is switching from a social media uh, company to a, a more technique advanced, uh, especially the VR and the online working mode. Uh, we do have a, a question about how do you think about that kind of trend, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, I have a concern, it's like, uh, although we designed the smartphone as a portable device, a pad, and those kind of, to let people move around, uh, be more convenient. But actually, if you look at the lifestyle, we have changed uh, dramatically from a very active mode to a more sedentary mode. And, uh, I just imagine in the future, people just need to put himself or herself in a small room and uh, just surfing on the virtual reality uh, with its connection with the internet. And I just uh, could do some, ask for some food delivery, delivery and they can spend a year, so <laughs> or even the whole life in the room. So is that is that a positive future or, or anything else? How do you think about this kind of trend? <laughs> yeah. uh... Yes, I am not a technologist. Um, I admit to being an early doctor of technology, but I'm not a technologist or um, a future, you know, uh, I don't have my magic eight ball. Um, I will say that the appeal of convenience is not new. And this, I think this Although the, the the rate of change is obviously rapidly increasing, um, I mean, technology grows at an exponential, not a linear rate. So um, that's, that's certainly true, but people have complained about, for example, um, the use of, of GPS units in the wilderness um, when those first came around. Um, the transition from uh, the horse and buggy to the car uh, the transition from reading a newspaper to the radio to the TV, and now obviously to um, the metaverse. Um, so in each of these transitions, people have pushed back um, and had these concerns. And I'm not at all saying that I'm not concerned about these things, but I, I think that there is some history of, of this <laughs> process. And um, Ultimately, it comes down, I think, to convenience and safety, it seems like. Um, during COVID, obviously, we, we had to change grocery, grocery delivery, healthcare um, utilization uh, out of safety, but now people are recognizing the convenience of it as well. So, um, you know, I, I, tend to, I tend to be an optimist. I tend to think that there is some... Um, there are some basic psychological needs that uh, people feel like they just can't meet in the virtual space. Um, you know, pet therapy is just not the same. You know, <laughs> people have studied this 
computer con study that um, they can have benefits. But I feel like when people are exposed to the real thing, they know it and they seek it out. And so I think the important thing is to make sure that our kids are continue to get outside and to see and to, to get down on their knees and get scraped and bloody, just like Edward Abbey talks about, um, so that they know what a real experience is like. Um, and that same, that's true in, in, in the natural space, but also the social space, obviously interacting with real people. And, and, um, uh, and then I think they're gonna seek it out. They're, they're realize that um, they have some intrinsic drive to seek that out in their life. So maybe that's an overly optimistic future, but um, it'll be very, we'll all be very interested to see how, it, how, how things progress. Thank you, thank you for your wonderful answer. We can discuss more in the future. Thank you. Yeah. We hope you can visit our campus after the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yes, so that can, would be lovely. I, that's a have... perfect example. It's a perfect <laughs> example, you know. I've, I'm, I love being here, but now I feel like I really need to be there with you and, and have a meal and, um, and see, you know, physically see your campus and, and everything like that. So. Uh, but I think that's because I was, you know, I grew up in a non-virtual world. So I, I do think it's very serious. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not so much concerned about the increasing accessibility of virtual spaces as I am making sure that our kids experience real uh, experiences um, so that they seek those out as adults. Thank you so much. I think it's getting late. Uh, people have other agenda. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Dr. Browning. Uh, My thank pleasure. you uh, for, for all the faculty members and the students from HKU. And thank you for all the guests from other institutions, universities, and uh, other uh, organizations. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day and a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Let's keep contact through the email and other social media, okay, <laughs> virtually and uh, physically, hopefully, after the pandemic. Okay, thank you.